Do you want to say something, Catherine, before we jump yeah, in? Yeah, look, just welcome everyone to the Dr. Compost Q&A session for this week. Um, it's uh, just Peter and myself today. Uh, so this is Peter Howard. I'm going to let him do a little quick intro for those who haven't met him before. And I'm here to help him with uh, any live questions that you might have that uh, you, you have uh, by watching this live session. Please pop them into the chat and uh, we'll try and answer them. We've also got a whole lot of great questions from our Grow Hub contributors. So, um, yeah, and Peter's got a bit of good news about our Grow Hub that he'll share. So, yeah, welcome everyone. Give us your questions. We're here to help you with anything you might have about composting with Subpod. So, over to you, Peter. Great. So, uh, hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I'm here to help you out with whatever, um, you know, interesting questions you have for me or whatever is happening for you in the Subpod that you want a bit more support with. I'm here to support you. There's the good news is there's 16,000 people now on Grow Hub, so the community is thriving. And what's really nice that way is we're getting lots of people from lots of different climates that can be uh, trying stuff out in snow and uh, you know hot summer sun and all of that. So we can make sure everyone's got a good composting experience no matter what. And so um, so far it's been really really successful and fun to uh, to kind of get these interesting uh, vantage points from different parts of the world. So. Without any further ado, I think I'll jump right in. First question we have for the day is um, from Roberta from the Grow Hub, and she's asking, how do you combat all the nitrogen in the cat urine when adding it to your sub pod? Well, I first of all would probably not consider adding cat urine into the sub pod um, unless it's just part of the um, bedding that you're adding with, with the um, compostable bedding. Um, but it's true that if you have a very acidic solution, you want to neutralize it. Um, so first of all, if, if the urine is um, in the bedding, what you could do is you can sprinkle in some uh, bicarbonate of soda, baking soda. That is a nice way to, to neutralize it. So that way you're pacifying the acidity and making sure you're not um, putting the worms under stress when you add that. to. And also, it always has a good rule of thumb if you're adding something that's strongly acidic just a little bit at a time is is the safe safe remedy and look you know just on that cat urine thing you know if you've got kitty litter that's you know got urine in it cat urine obviously a lot of those now are made out of sort of paper products what, what's your thoughts about adding it you know from a kitty litter tray oh yeah so what i've what i've said to people asking about that is make sure that the version of kitty litter that you've got is is either um uh, compostable as, as claimed on the packaging and you want to avoid all the clay based cat litters and the ones that are crystals have crystals in them those don't compost well but pretty much everything that's that's paper based um, or grain based sawdust based those are all good choices um, as long as you just add a little bit at a time and they're fine um, the other thing we do say about um, animal manures except for maybe uh, cow which is which is um, not going to have any sort of um, concerns is you might want to make sure that the compost you make you use from that um, animal pet manure based sub pod use it's that you put that onto plants that aren't eaten raw to just to ensure that there's no sort of carryover from from pathogens to uh, to humans if the food is cooked it's probably going to be fine and certainly if it's put under fruit and nut trees that's not going to be a problem either. But if you grow lettuces, I would um, not use that subpod uh, castings just to be on the safe side. Okay, next question we've got is, can worms remove parasites and chemicals from soils and plants? That's an interesting question. Um, for the most part, think of worms as shepherds or farmers of bacteria for your, for your um, food waste. So they're they play the role of um, they'll swallow a bit of grit and grind up the food a bit smaller, but they're facilitating the digestion of the food by the microbes. So yes, in fact, microbes do a really great job of breaking things down, um, and that includes chemicals. Parasites is an interesting one because um, parasites are quite quite host specific. So it's a it's parasite to the plant world. It's not going to be a concern for humans. Um, but if it's it's a parasite that, say, has infected your plant, I, I would not put that material into your compost just to be on the safe side that you don't transmit that to other plants. So um, 
The other thing right. that I do, sorry, right. I'll just finish that thought. Yeah. The other thing that I do is I'll make a liquid compost extract from the subpod mix and I'll spray that on um, to the leaves of the plant. So a foliar spray. And that actually coats the surface, the plant leaves with the microbes pr providing actually a barrier. So if there's things that have landed on the leaves of those plants, the microbes can actually go to work and start to break those down and form a, a healthy relationship with the plant to prevent, say, pathogenic fungus from, from colonizing the plant surfaces. Catherine, you had a... Yeah, you know, look, I'm just, we've got, got some chat interaction happening here. We've got oh, Diana, okay. Diana here doing a bit of a follow-up from the, uh, the cat. She's asking about rabbit litter boxes. Yes, yeah, so if it's recycled paper, that's totally fine. And um, if it's got a strong nitrogen smell, then that means there's a lot of nitrogen in it. And so you might want to um, let it pacify a bit, which is what I like to say is um, basically store it a bit until it's not very woofy with ammonia before you would add it to the um, subpod. Um, but it, it, any animal manure is fine in, in modest amounts. So um, if you're generating quite a lot of animal manure, just make sure, or the, or the litter with, with manure in it, um, you just want to add a little bit at a time and that's, that's going to be fine. Just not a whole lot all at once. And the other thing to keep in mind is the more volume of bedding you have in your subpod, the more you're diluting down whatever food you're putting in. So if you're just starting off your system, there's no problem whatsoever in going to your local big box store and buying extra bricks of the, um, coconut coir to add more volume um, and that'll just dilute out um, food if it's if it's a strong food that's got a lot of acidity like the uh, manures and then you just add less carbon when you're adding your food because you've pre-loaded your system with lots of carbon to start with yeah i love that pre-loading idea that that sort of will alleviate especially that. yeah especially for people um say you know during the week, the compost is full, but they don't have much time. If they preloaded with carbon, they can just put in the food waste, stir it around, and they've already handled the carbon side of things. So you can always just add carbon from time to time and not feel like you have to do it with every uh, food waste addition if you preload it that way. So she's just followed up saying, I always age the rabbit litter for three days because the common pathogens don't live more than three days without a host. Okay, that's good to know. Well, um, excellent. You're right on top of it. Um, just give it a, an experimental sniff, and if the smells have, if the ammonia smells have abated, then you're probably good to go. And just do the sniff test, and right. you might Thanks leave it. Right, that, that, That's great. And um, probably the warmer the weather or the more airflow you can put that material into, the more you'll off-gas the volatile um, nitrogen compounds before they go in. So then the other thing is um, just keep an eye on the worms and make sure they're healthy and doing well. Um, and if um, you, you need to now and then, you can add a bit of a buffer. Um, it's more likely that the system could go acid rather than basic. And so putting in a little bit of agricultural lime or baking soda or things that can perk it right back up. Agricultural lime is even better than the baking soda because it doesn't have sodium. Okay, next question. We have, can you compost fruit fly larva? It, it very often can happen that you um, have your kitchen caddy and somehow the fruit fly have found their way in. Some of the kitchen caddy designs have holes in the top with a carbon filter and the flies can fly right into those and lay eggs in the carbon filter and then they drop into your compost. Catherine's just showing you a nice picture of what they look like. They're quite tiny. Um, they're fine to compost in your um, system, but you want to make sure you bury that food waste deep into the bedding so they don't end up as as flies. So you avoid having flies in the top of your subpod. Just make sure you bury the food waste. Okay, next question we have from Jessica in GrowHub, and she's asking about worm foods and how did I go? So I think she's got a picture associated with this. And uh, yep, there we are. And she even went to the trouble of rinsing the tomato sauce. Um, that's that's sweet that you went to that trouble. You don't have to do that, actually. That's fine. Tomato sauce can go in there with everything else. And that, that's perfectly ready to add to the um, subpod. The worms will tuck right into that food. 
Yep. And so just to give you a little, uh, sorry, I was just going to give you, she, she said that she's got banana, watermelon, cantaloupe, eggs, a very small amount of spaghetti rinsed of sauce, cut up recycled cardboard and some paper. How did she go? So she's, yeah, was wanting to know. I, and I said to her, I just love the amount of love that people are putting into um, into their worm food prepara preparation. Um, and look how small that she's chopped it all. So I, that's I that's true. That. That's yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, that, that's nice to have a balance of foods like that, a diversity of vegetables and fruit and and a bit of paper in there and some grains. So, yep, diversity is gonna gonna really make your system thrive. Okay, I've already jumped on to this next question, which is um, also has an image coming with it. And they're asking about something from the mushroom water, wipe down and leave um, mixed fungal um, with the soil and environment. So, oh yeah, okay. So if you get um, fungal growth that comes from, um, from, it looks like from the lid of that container, you can break it up into pieces. Um, if you have quite a bit of it that's grown, you can, um, you can break it up into small pieces and and dilute it out in the in the system, but um, it's one of the one of the um, microbial uh, uh, benefactors in your in your system. So they're they're doing their job to break things down. Just just um, spread it around and break it up into small pieces is fine. So while we're on the mushroom topic, maybe we'll just jump to this one, Peter, which is also about mushrooms. Okay. Um, and this person uh, is it Tabiata Tabiata. From Grow Hub, um, again saying that her subpod and bed seem to be inundated with some sort of mushroom, and should she be worried, and what should she do? Okay, well, in the photo I'm seeing, it's looking like the soil of the garden bed, and what can happen is if the soil gets damp and it's been amended with um, with a good uh, sort of a, a wood-based kind of material, um, it provides uh, fuel for microbes, and if there's spores that have landed then mushrooms will start growing so, oh there we go okay great um it's not anything to worry about basically your soil is probably quite rich and it's growing through the walls and um you can break it up um i would add a bit more bedding to that sub pod just to to fluff it out a bit and um, as you see those structures forming you can you can break them up as they as you go and, and look, you know, I know that some people use mushroom compost in their soil mix. So do you think that could also be bringing in spores and, and um, yeah, a bit of... Yeah, there's, yeah there's, there's different ways um, the mushroom spores can get into the soil, but it's generally a, a condition of the soil is quite wet to support um, a lot of mushrooms. So one thing you could consider doing if, if, it, was, if it was a concern, it, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Is make sure you've got some um, mulch on top of that bare soil, and that will that will help condition things a bit as well. So if you covered it with a bit of um, shredded sugarcane mulch, if you're in Australia, that's an easy comp, um, product to come by. You can buy organic shredded sugarcane mulch or a bit of hay. Just make sure you're covering the bare soil. I think those would be good things to do. Yeah, I'm a big fan of mulch. It really, um, you know, it helps not only adds more organic matter to the soil, but it also, you know, encourages the worms to feel safe enough to travel out um, with a bit of protective layer. And, and of course, you know, the plants love to have the, the, mo the moist uh, soil. Yeah, it's true. And, the, and think of it as the, um, the microbes in the soil are um, sun sensitive. And so you're actually giving them a bit of an umbrella when you add uh, mulch to the top of the soil and protecting the soil, the top layer from to be as healthy as possible. Yeah, good point. It's not just about the worms, it's the microbes as it, well. The whole environment. But, but Catherine's right about you'll encourage the, um, the worms to go cruising around and, and um, exploring their, their habitat. So let's see. Next question we've got using paper and cardboard that is bleached and dyed. I would avoid, if you can, is um, chemically treated papers um, and dyes. It's um, not, not the best choice, especially if the paper is glossy. Um, if it's just white paper and you have a few sheets of it, that's fine. That's not a problem. But um, we, we tend to 
advise people not to use the glossy uh, photo um, sheets um, in, in their sub pod. And what about, you know, like a lot of schools I talk to, they have office paper that they can obviously put through the shed shredder to add to their sub pod. If they've got some that's got bleach in it, I mean, it, can you use some of it until they can change over? Because, like, you know, they have to order large volumes of, of paper. And until they can they can move over to something like Planet Arc or something that doesn't have bleach in it, is it okay it's, to use it's, some? It's, yeah, it's okay. Small amounts are not going be problematic i think it's going to be fine something as thin as paper it's not going to hold a lot in that surface so yeah yeah i would say that would be okay okay we've covered the mushroom question now we've got a question about juvenile worms they're hard to separate from compost i had the same thing um okay so the worms will avoid the light and so if you if you want to um, protect the little worms um, you basically spread your compost and keep scraping the top layer and the worms that are big enough um, that you'll you'll be able to see will keep going down and down and then that way you can separate the the worms from the compost so often the easiest way to do that is you make little piles of the of the uh, sub pod bedding and then you keep scraping around the uh, outside of the pile. So if you're producing a cone, you keep scraping and they keep moving, worms move into the interior. And eventually you end up with a pile of worms at the very bottom of that um, pile that you put back in the sub pod. So I'm also, um, we've had a lot of wet weather up here in, in the Northern Rivers um, area. So as soon as we get a bit of sun, I'm gonna show you a passive where you can set up a screen pile your compost on top of that screen and the, and the worms will actually just crawl through on their own to avoid the light and then you just lift the screen off and collect that that compost that's the easy way to do it too so um that's to, that'll be an article soon on the grow hub okay i just noticed that trina has joined us um she was the one that you answered the question about you know chemicals and uh parasites and things so Trina, I just want to let you know that if you watch the replay, uh, we put your question was one of the first ones that we answered. So, um, yeah, have a look back on that one. Um, so just wanted to throw that one in before we move on to the mole lizard question. Yes, mole lizards. So, um, yeah, so if she had any questions, then we can, we can put that there. Okay, mole lizards. Yeah, I've never seen these before. Um, but I, I, I'm hearing that they're, they're originally from Mexico or they're common in Mexico and they're finding their way to the southern part of the US. And um, they are vertebrates. So unlike the worms which are invertebrates, they're a bit higher order on animal species and they are carnivores. So they, they tend to eat insects and bugs, but they will eat worms on the surface. So they're not gonna burrow down too deep, but if you have worms coming up the surface, they will they will get them. And so um, you you would lose worms if you had a lot of them in your system. But if you had one, um, and I think this person said they're quick, um, if they're, yeah, I think uh, just to make sure that your, um, your wormholes on the side of the bin are completely closed so um, uh, that they're not getting in. And um, you could try an experiment where you put, um, a little bit of um, like a block at the very top of the chamber in the um, inside of the sub pod so that they don't burrow in just under the surface to get inside of your in your sub pod uh, if they're a problem. But I suspect keep an eye on the worms to make sure that they're, um, uh, they're, you're still keeping healthy population. And if it's only one mole lizard, then um, it's going to be probably okay. It'll coexist. But if you start getting a big population, then I would think about, um, you know, finding ways to extricate them. So, um, yeah, I see they're, they're, they scurry, scurry away too quickly to catch. Um, so, yeah, in, the, in terms of coexistence, they will eat a few of the worms, but they, they won't um, demolish your population. So um, just keep an eye on the worms and make sure um, that you're not losing um, a lot of worms. And then um, if you are, please contact us and I'll research ways to get rid of them. But I, I did a casual look to see if I could find a way to knock them down and they're relatively rare. And so, or at least in the in what I found online as far as eradication. So 
Um, but I'll do some working on that if I um, if it becomes problematic. So interestingly, like Deanna's just um, added a little question or a comment about skinks, which was what I was talking to Peter before we started the live, is that I too had skinks in my, well, she had them in an old compost pile, but still had lots of worms. Thankfully, the skinks won't fit through the holes in the sub pot. Wow. Perfect. What, what, <laughs> what size skinks you've got. I've got those little ones in Australia that are, can fit through the worm holes, but as I was sharing with Peter, you know, still, you know, there seems to be heaps of worms in there. So they must be coexisting somehow. Yeah, well, it's the same. They'll, especially because they're lizards, they'll be dwelling on the surface. So the only worms they would pick off would be the ones that come up to the surface. So the majority of them will stay underneath. And um, um, looks like there's a photo on graphics for the skins for people who are curious about that. Um, Oh, there we go. Yeah, they're um, mostly going to be a larger size that wouldn't wouldn't get into the sub pod. But for yours, Catherine, are, if, if your worm holes are covered with soil, or the skinks shouldn't be able to get in. Yeah, that's a point. I probably have, it probably has dropped a little bit. So, but I'll have, but I'll have to shoot the skink out. That's right. <laughs> and then yeah. chop up my soil. I think well, I'll luckily, rain, it's kind luckily, of. Luckily, be, because, because they're lizards and hang out on the surface, there's only so far they can they can go to evade you. Can, you should be able to push them out. But anyway, yeah, they're, they're, um, they're um, easy to deal with, I would say. Okay. Um, I, the next question I see is getting a sub pod started in autumn. Okay, so it's actually good you're starting it before winter. Winter would be more challenging. Um, but what I would say to starting a sub pod is you want to make sure to think about, especially if you're in a colder place, is in insulating ideas so that you start with a good amount of worms. You'll still start with a small amount of food. As the temperatures drop, the worms will eat less, so your population won't grow as quickly. So it might take a bit longer for your population to build up. But if you can make sure to mulch the soil around the, um, in the bed around the sub pod, that's important. And then um, you can look into the, if you're actually in a, a colder state in the US, there are these um, great cold frames that you can buy to put right on top of the sub pod. And that'll, uh, you'll, you'll be able to do that in, in the autumn before winter comes on. And that'll allow you to build up the population before it truly gets cold. So that's, that's my recommendation. Okay, the next question we've got is Danielle from Colorado. And she's looking to purchase the sub pod bundle with a garden bed. Doesn't look like there's a lot of room enough to plant. So Catherine's showing you a nice uh, illustration of putting in um, trellises behind the bed and go vertical. So you make use of that vertical growing space. Um, I, for example, this last season was growing these amazing snake beans that were uh, growing up two meters high or six, more than six feet, seven feet behind my um, my bed. And it's very prolific and you get exposed to the plants to all that air and circulation. So you can just set up a, um, a nice trellis at the back of your um, system. And then the good news about that is the plant roots can be easy tucking in through the wormholes into the sub pod compost and then climbing the trellis behind and producing lots of goodness for your plate. But I also just find the amount of things that I can grow in a small garden bed like this, it really was for me a, a game changer in realizing that you can put more in that you normally would because of the high concentration of nutrients. So um, this goes to show just this little garden beds that we had here set up. Uh, that was just pre-COVID and then we had an automatic watering system. We came back, you know, like I think it was six weeks later and it, like everything was just booming. So yeah um that's that's what i love about the fact that you can just cram a lot more in yeah and you can go you can both go both directions so you could send stuff up a trellis and you can have trailing vines that come out and and drop down so one of the members of our, our group actually has got it pumpkins growing out of his garden beds where he lets the vine come out from the sub pod uh, garden bed trail along the ground and harvest pumpkins that way 
So that's another thing to consider. Okay. Okay, this person has a sub pod arriving this week and they're considering planting potatoes and marigolds in the raised bed. I've not done those two together. Um, you could, um, the, I think there's not a lot of space for harvesting the potatoes, but uh, depending on your climate, uh, another thing to consider is if you did sweet potatoes instead of uh, regular potatoes is you can actually harvest the greens for, um, for a green to eat from sweet potatoes and that way you can get double duty from your um from your plants and you'll and you'll be able to harvest that productivity uh, marigolds um do work perfectly fine uh on their own they're they're good at butt chasing um pests away so if you if you were doing potatoes you might want to do the small ones like the fingerling potatoes that would actually have enough space to um to grow in the bed Okay, next question. I'm a little confused. This is from um, Sue. I'm a little confused about continuing to feed and remove compost from my mini. Okay, so this is the interesting thing is you're in a position where you don't have separate chambers. You're not starving out one side and having the worms migrate to the other side. Um, what I do, and um, it works quite well, is you you set up a, a bit of a sorting table where you can pull out the compost and you have a couple choices i have a, a little article on um on the grow hub uh site that shows great things to do with the compost where i take a sieve and i'll put the um the, the sub pod compost through that and shake it and you can pick off the pieces of food that haven't been broken down yet put them into a bucket and then you can um basically take the worms that are on that. The sieve has to be a small enough uh, diameter the worms are staying on top of it. You put them into the second bucket and then the, the finished compost falls through to the bottom. That's, that's one way to go. Another way to go is again, the light avoidance technique where you have a screen and you um, put the worms and unfinished compost on top. The worms crawl through. You can pick off the unfinished compost, put it back into sub pod and then harvest the um, the castings that are that are sitting on top. Okay. Just, just throw an image of a mini there, <clears throat> just as if people were wondering what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, a single chambered um, sub pod. Yep. Okay, this person is setting up their sub pod. This is um, Tora from Grow Hub, uh, Trina from to to uh, Grow Hub. She's setting up a sub pod on the second story balcony. And she's asking if she can line the bottom of the planter with a shower pan liner and no drainage. Um, yes, so you um, you could do that as long as the liner was big enough to actually go around the outside of the bed so you could actually keep an, a visual eye on um, what would happen with water draining um, to the bottom of the bed. So this is another example of a way to go where we actually are coming out the a uh, modular bed that will drain from the bottom if it's overwatered and it can be rolled around on legs so that you can um, basically do your composting on a balcony and it all is um, contained quite quite well. So um, that's another another possibility. Um, but um, yeah, if you if you line your your sub pod, you do want to provide some kind of drainage because otherwise the water can back up if the wet rain comes in from the side and saturates your bed, then it could be a bit problematic for the um, for the worm. So our recommendation is go go with one of these kind of beds. The bottom of it actually is a is a um, uh, a wicking is a fiber surface that can can drip through, so it it protects the worms from getting waterlogged. Um, but then you could put a pen underneath that to catch any excess water from say. Yeah, I, I know. I, I just thought I'd throw the mod bed up there because then I thought, oh, she we might have been talking about that, but no, she's talking about the uh, the, the original sub pods. But this is another option. From, it's another option. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, if she's got a this this bed we have is set up for a mini, so if she's got a full size sub pod, she she would have to um, um, consider something like that. Um, what I would consider doing is um, is probably the safest thing is is 
go ahead and put in a double layer of geotextile landscape cloth. Um, you, uh, actually, what you could do is very first put a rubber mat on the surface of the, of the um, deck and then a couple layers of the geotextile fabric and then put your soil in that. So whatever liquid leaks through is filtered through the geotextile fabric and so it's less likely to stain, produce any stains on the deck surface. Um, if this is a wooden deck, it's a bit problematic to have damp um, things up against the surface. So this is where we suggest having a raised bed, such as the image shown here, where you're keeping airflow and circulation so that so the wood is not at yeah. risk of rotting. If it's a concrete balcony, then it's totally fine to do what I've suggested with the um, rubber mat and the um, landscape cloth. Okay, next question we've got. Hang on, I've got someone here. Trina is uh, back with us from okay. um, live. My okay. friend Gardner bought two mini sub pods. I asked her mm -hmm. if the package included instructions on the ideal ratio of mini sub pod to size of bed, but she wants to design her own bed, their own bed. What is the ratio of bed to mini? You can you can really make it the bed as large as you want. There's no um, there's no restriction. Um, if you have, are, are each of the minis going into um, one bed? If they are, then I would separate them um, to opposite sides of the bed so that the worms basically can crawl between the minis. Um, but really, you're you're just you're needing the garden bed just to provide a conditioning for the sub pod, and you can always be harvesting castings and moving them specifically to each plant. Um, so, so the further the plants are away from the mini, um, the more you might actually think about making a compost tea, uh, an extract. I've got an article about how to do that in the grow hub that you can water those plants with. Um, there's no real um, limit on that. It's, it's pretty much as long as you have a big enough bed to fit the, um, the mini with some soil perimeter around all sides. It's, that's the minimum size, and there's really not a maximum to, to be concerned about. Okay. Um, next question we've got here is Veronica from from GrowHub. Okay, as home gardeners, what can we do to protect these invasive worm species, European and jumping worms? So um, European worms are not actually a problem. Um, European worms actually are um, the red crawlers that, that are um, often used as compost worms. Um, the upper image is showing the Asian jumping worms, and that's a different story. So they have this very characteristic white band that goes all the way around the worm, and it's, it's a bit raised from the surface of the uh, worm, and that's, that's a characteristic feature of, of the um, jumping worms. Um, and they are problematic, and they they can um, they're they're aggressive, and they can they can wipe out your compost worms. And so, going back to um, a consideration is actually if Catherine, you bring up the um, the mod bed again. Um, well, I've been thinking about on the on the mod bed. Um, so, so look at the fact that you've got the the bed is entirely protected from soil so there's no way the um, jumping worms can get access to the sub pod it's entirely protected and so it's a way to basically um, have a balance of you're keeping the worms in contact with soil but they're not going to they're not at risk of being wiped out by jumping jumping worms so either I, e either using this mini or or a version where you could actually have a raised bed that's isolated from the soil for, and would you do could you do something like you know sit the feet of the mod bed into little things of you know, protective layer around you know so like you you wouldn't you wouldn't need to do that no you would need to do that the the um the jumping worms are not going to crawl up the legs the metal legs of this um this raised bed and and get into the soil that's that's not um, that's not really what they're what they tend to do so you'd be that that's enough as is. I mean, you could you could um, set the set the bed on a on a gravel surface so there's not soil at the bottom. That's that's a possibility, but I think it would it would be safe to um, to isolate them. 
Oh, a question just came up from um, Barbara from GrowHub, and she's asking, at what rate should I spread worm castings? Um, you know, there's what the nice thing about the worm castings is they're not too concentrated of a fertilizer. So you um, there's really not an upper limit. Um, what I would do is there's if, if you are trying to make a little bit go a long ways, you can um, basically make an extract of the of the castings where you get a um, paint strainer bag and you put them into that and massage the bag in a bucket of water and then you can water a lot of plants with that liquid and spread it around. Um, otherwise, you can just take a little handful of castings in the same bed where you have the subpod and then the worms can actually find their way back into the um, subpod. Um, but really what you'll notice is that the plants perk up when you give them the castings. And if you reapply them, say, once every um, couple of months, if they're, if they're um, fast growing um, annuals, then you'll you'll really see a, a difference if you're actually watering them with the extract once a week would or once every 10 days would really be um give you a great result okay next question we've got is oh i think this might have been the mushroom question that was handled earlier so yeah let's go to the layery yeah. one um because so, this has a bit more information it was just that she's ready to order her sub pod but she has a question her garden is in the process of being made <clears throat> two weeks to go and is waiting to order her worms until the pod has arrived or until the garden's built um, but can she start the layering process in the sub pod with her compost before she buries it and before the worms arrive yeah, what I would do is I would go ahead and buy the bedding, the um, the coconut coir, ideally, that you can buy and hydrate and, and put that into your sub pod and let that condition. But I wouldn't add any food to the system until the worms are there. Um, you you want to be having the worms present and settled in before food gets added. So, um, yeah, if you have the sub pod now, really all you can do is just um, buy a bit of bedding and um, if, if you wanted to um, put the worms into that before the actual garden bed is built, then just make sure you wrap the outside of the, of the sub pod so that the worm holes are um, protected um, from out the air surface. And then you can move that into your bed once it's ready. That could work. Okay. Um, is that the last question we've got? Do you have any more? Um, Live no, I've got another one here, which is about the Honeywell air purifiers. Okay. To, um, yes, I remember reading that one. So the person was asking, can they compost their um, air purifier, their Honeywell air? air um, it's, a, it's a carbon filter. And when I read through that, I thought, okay, well, all you need to do is take a pair of scissors and, and chop that up finely. And what will happen is... Um, that will that will start to break down um now if especially if, if it's actually she checked and they said it was just made of um carbon so so it will break down if you had something that was coated plastic no that that wouldn't work but if you've got um something that's just made of a, of a stranded um carbon material then it will break down and it's totally fine to add to the system all right now we had another little interaction here from deanna okay. um, and she has just been saying that she uh, is also planning on feeding worm castings to her hermit crabs interesting uh, worm castings and green sand are two hermit crab staples so okay that was huh? okay that's interesting yeah let us let us know how you go with that that sounds good and then we've also got another question here from Trina that uh, about she attended a lecture on vermicomposting. Um, mm -hmm. Asked her, what is the quantity of worms per area, a thousand square foot? Uh, yeah, so I don't know how many she was saying, but yeah, how many worms per area for vermicomposting on a farm? Hmm. Jeez, well, she, yeah. Yeah, thousand, I mean, oh, sorry, a thousand a square foot. Sorry, a thousand square foot of worms. So I suppose it's not composting worms she's talking about. She's probably talking about earthworms. Um, it sounds earthworms. like yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a different story. So vermicomposting is is when you're using compost worms in particular to to break down your your materials, and they they behave differently in this in um, the garden. So a typical earthworm is great for um, basically fluffing up the soil as it moves through the earth. It'll its little burrows are um, going to provide air in the in the soil, and then you. Um, you leave a little bit of residue of, of um, actually calcium in the trails of the earthworms, which is great for the soil as well. In contrast to this, the compost worms are going to be working in the leaf litter layer above the soil. So those, if setting up vermiculture compost on the farm, you'd want to have that in a, in a structure that you can set above the soil rather than in the soil. Okay, looks like we have... Um, the healthy number of composting worms is one pound per square foot of bin surface area. Um, yeah, that's fine. I mean, really, what's what what is determining the population of worms per unit area is um, when you have a when you start a system with a small number of worms, um, they will breed up according to the food supply. And so, what we're doing in the subpod system is we're aerating the um, the bedding. And so that's bringing in a lot of air. And so depending on how much food you're supplying on a regular basis, the worms will naturally adjust their population numbers to consume that food. And they actually um, have a built-in mechanism to stop producing more offspring so they don't outstrip their food supply. All right, well, look, just before we finish up, I've just seen a question that's been, um, and it's kind of a bit relevant to our conditions of weather that we've been having lately. Mm -hmm. She's just saying that, uh, this is from Kylie from Grow Hub, um, mm -hmm. saying that her sub pod seems to, uh, a bit wet still and not ready to harvest. I've had the system about five to six months and I've not fed the left side in two weeks, hoping to harvest, but it's still damp and now the side is full. Do I stop feeding it completely, question mark? What do I do? I already did the coir pee to dry it up and it did help some. It's not wet, just damp and, and able to screen out casting. I guess she's mean it's not, not able to screen out the castings. Okay, Maybe. so so um, what she could do is, um, is try the light avoidance method rather than the screen if it's if it's too damp for screening. Um, and I... And I I am going to produce a version where I use a light source rather than using sunlight because the sun's just not cooperating now. So you could have a couple of lights sitting over the screen and then the worms will crawl through that. But it's um, if you need to, what you can always do is add a bit more um, coconut coir to, to dry it just a bit further and know that when you are sieving that through, your, your castings are going to be a combination of the coconut coir plus the castings which will be fine for any soil amendment there's no downside to having a bit of coconut coir with the um, worm castings when you when you sieve it through so that might be the easiest recommendation for for your situation is add just a bit more um coir and you don't have to rehydrate it very much first just the minimum amount so you maximize um sopping up the excess moisture and then go ahead and sieve that material and um, and then use that as you would for your castings. Should should be fine. All right, then. And Deanna's just come back saying that they did say the pre-filter was compostable, but just wanted to check. Good. Yeah. It's always you, you, we're here to to help you figure stuff out. And in a way, what's nice about that material is it's very similar to the um, biochar that I'm using in my system, where I basically have a charcoal. Um, that is is going in, which it provides lots of benefits, and so those um, those carbon filters are are charcoal filters, and so they're actually not only um, no downside, but there's actually a good upside to them as well because they tend to bind nutrients and hold on to them, so that when you add that, as long as it breaks down well, then you, when you add it to your soil, you're actually providing nutrients in a form that can stick around for a while even with the heavy rains. And she also just had a great idea of the sub pod video game. <laughs> okay. Keep an eye out for our app. We're just we're developing the app that's going to go alongside sub pod. So there will definitely be things like that for uh, getting the kids engaged or, 
or um, yeah, it, all sorts of ages engaged with their sub pod and growing things and composting. So, yeah. So, okay, Peter, anything you want to finish off with? I think we've come to our 45 minute mark. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, uh, no, no last minute live questions. We're, we're good. No, that seems to be the last one. The only thing I want to make comment of is next week, Subpod team, we're hoping, fingers crossed, we're all gathering for our annual get together in person to brainstorm and to develop things like the new app that we're, we're, we're um, putting together. But uh, we're hoping to do a little live session or some sort of session there next Thursday. But if we don't, we'll definitely be back with Dr. Compost the following week at the same time. So just keep an eye out on the Grow Hub. We'll post uh, which event and the date um, when, when we've um, sorted out whether we're gathering and what's happening. So um, it's a thank you from me and just a last minute handover to Dr. Compost and keep those questions coming in the Grow Hub, everyone. Love, uh, love all of this engagement. Happy, happy composting and happy gardening and um, have, a, have a great week and see you guys soon. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.